So, what was the Slovak national uprising? What was it all about? Why did it start? On the 14th of March, the Slovak state is uh, created as basically as a satellite state of Nazi uh, Germany, Bohemia and Moravia are occupied, and Czechoslovakia is dissolved on the 15th of March. Um, Slovakia became a subordinate to the uh, political and economic needs of uh, Nazi Germany, and of course, a regime uh, existed in Slovakia at the time, the regime of the Linka Slovak People's Party, which served for these sort of purposes. The war in Slovakia found itself uh, in a war very early on, already in March 1939, the so-called Little War uh, against Hungary, that only lasted for a few days uh, and was then uh, later stopped. Nevertheless, Slovakia further lost territory during this war. Um, this war was stopped by the inter uh, intervention of Adolf Hitler because a much more important conflict was looming and uh, any conflicts between the countries which were allied with Germany or with the satellite states were not allowed. So therefore this war was stopped very quickly. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, party uh, usurps the power structure, a uh, totalitarian state is created and of course uh, this also has the effect that many people, uh, although at start quite contempt with being in such a state, later on see that there's uh, also a lot of problems with being living in a totalitarian regime. Uh, in September of 1939, uh, the Second World War starts and Slovak, the Slovak army is also part of this. Uh, together with the German forces, it attacks Poland and joins up in the general struggle during the Second World War. This further continues in June 1941, where the uh, biggest amount of Slovak soldiers take part in two divisions, the uh, fast division and the security division, move together with the German forces on the Eastern Front and fight there for two and a half years. Uh, the experiences of the soldiers during those two and a half years in the, on the Eastern Front are very important for shaping their ideals and what they actually were supposed to fight for and the majority of the soldiers then serving on the Eastern Front then also take part during uh, the fight of the uprising. So their activities there and their experiences there are very, very important. Uh, of course, there were uh, several problems connected with uh, being a satellite state of Nazi Germany being completely uh, economically subservient, following the needs of the country, and of course, political independence was also more or less an illusion, especially after the uh, Salzburg talks from June 1941. Please, you can go further. Uh, how did the resistance uh, start, how it was created? The, the, a resistance was created the, the moment the Slovak state was created. Very many people were uh, quite unhappy about the situation. Uh, the dissolution of Czechoslovakia was of course an aggressive act and the creation of the Slovak state was uh, basically a dictate. Nobody asked the people if they won the state, basically it was uh, dictated. Therefore many people had problems with that. Uh, in March 1939, the moment the Slovak state is created, free foreign officers of the country refused to obey the government of the Slovak uh, state. That was in Paris, in uh, Warsaw and uh, in Washington. Uh, these uh, representatives immediately refused to follow the orders of the government uh, and went basically created the first resistance groups in exile or were members of it. Um, also, Slovak, the Slovak state had uh, problems with recognition. Very few countries actually recognized from the free world this country as a continuation of the Czechoslovak Republic or that it was made, uh, it was created basically uh, a state by the will of the people. It was only accepted basically by the countries of the Axis or its uh, friendlies or its, uh, or its allies. One of the further problems uh, why the Slovak state found itself more and more in a difficult situation was that especially extremely radical members of the uh, Linka Slovak People's Party eventually came to power and these were two, Wojciech Tuka and Alexander Mach. These were very radical, especially Wojciech Tuka, who basically wanted to create a copy of National Socialism uh, uh, in Slovakia with all its aspects. He was really uh, the person who uh, really liked what Hitler was doing in Germany and he wanted to model the country uh, after him. He also became uh, one of the favorites of Adolf Hitler within the Slovak government. Throughout the existence of the Slovak state, there were three main groups of resistance. 
The first one, which was the uh, group which was the most, uh, which had the most members, can be counted as the civic democratic resistance. The second group was the social democratic resistance, which had much, much less members but was better organized. And the smallest group of the, res uh, of the resistance was the communist resistance, which was the smallest one but also the best organized one. Up until uh, the year 1943, the representatives of the resistance groups within Slovakia basically didn't talk to each other. Which is kind of understandable bit because with difficulty can a Democrat come to terms with a communist. Um, the most important dividing factor among these groups up until 1943 was their view on how the Czechoslovak Republic should look like after the war. In 1943, most of the resistance members understood of the general population that the Germany will lose the war and the Czechoslovak Republic will be re-established in some way or another. Now, that was the question how it will look like after the war. The civic democrats came with the idea that it should look like uh, exactly as it was just before the war. Uh, there will be only one nation acknowledged within the country, the Czechoslovak nation, and basically all the political system will stay the same. Uh, well, the communists had a completely different idea. Their representatives wanted the Sovietization of Slovakia. That means Slovakia will become a part of the Soviet Union. Well, that was unacceptable for the majority of the members. The uh, most forthcoming idea came from the uh, Social Democrats at that time, uh, who basically stated that yes, we will re-establish the Czechoslovak Republic, but in this country, the new republic, both nations, the Czechoslovaks, must have some form of autonomy. Uh, after several weeks of talks, they finally all agreed that this idea will be the most acceptable one, and with this idea we will go through uh, into the uprising. Um, just to mention a few of these resistance groups who were very active at that time, uh, for example, Flora, Justitia, Demets, uh, the group around Vavro Shrovar, and of course there was uh, military resistance groups around Captain uh, Milan Mortin, uh, Colonel Milko Vesel, Franciszek Urban, and Jan Golian. All of these men served on the Eastern Front, and later on when they returned to Slovakia, uh, they formed uh, very small resistance units within the German military, uh, the Slovak military, who tried to aid or in some way uh, be active in various resistance activities. Um, during, up until 1943, the resistance didn't commit any acts of sabotage or something similar. That never happened. The acts of resistance in this point, uh, as I mentioned them up there, are uh, spreading of information, getting people, more and more people, be involved in the resistance. Uh, getting uh, people who are hiding throughout Slovakia or want to come to Slovakia to hide them here and try to ensure that they will uh, be able to survive. That included uh, Jews, for example, politically persecuted persons, racially persecuted persons, uh, or also prisoners of war, for example, shot down pilots. That was also very common. This is just an imagination. Uh, written propaganda or written resistance was very common. Uh, printed out postcards, uh, plaquettes in newspapers were uh, distributed among the general population. This is one of the, which I found uh, very interesting and quite funny. On the left side, you can see four bigs in the middle. In Slovakia, it is written, where is the fifth swine? If you, if you fold it along those lines on the left, you will get ahead of Adolf Hitler. So, so this is the kind of uh, propaganda that's very common. Uh, uh, very often, the it was made comedic to ridicule, of course, the, either the regime or Adolf Hitler or, of course, any other uh, things associated with that. The mobilization of the resistance. What was the what were the key events when the, the, resist, the presence of the resistance in Slovakia uh, figured out that the war is going to change and that it is necessary to start preparing for something bigger? Uh, of course, the most important aspects in this regard were the turning points. Uh, the Allied invasion of uh, Italy, the Battle of Stalingrad, and especially after the Battle of Kursk in the summer of 1943, it was clear to everybody, who had a clear mind of course, that Germany is losing this war. They are going to lose it, and it is now only a question of time when the Eastern Front will move into Slovakia. So it is necessary to do something uh, about that. Second one was the defection of Slovak soldiers on the Eastern Front. Um, at this moment, very short, just to uh, give you an approximation, the imagination of a soldier 
a Slovak soldier on the Eastern Front. Uh, well, throughout 1941, especially early, uh, early 1941, they were massaged by propaganda. You are going to fight on the Eastern Front. You are going to fight against the Bolsheviks. The Stalinist regime is an absolute evil. The people that are suffering there, there are, uh, uh, millions of people are dying of starvation, the people are poor, and that's what are you going to fight against. Well, what happened? They went to the Eastern Front, uh, and what did they find out? Yeah. It was basically the truth. Yeah, the regime was horrible. The people were truly suffering there. And uh, if uh, the movie sequences, which I don't have here, but they are quite famous, you can see people, for example, in Ukraine throwing flowers on uh, German or Slovak tanks when units were moving around. <clears throat> well, but then came the second hit. They were, they were uh, moving in with an occupying force. And the Nazi forces, of course, the German army, in the end, had really nothing better to do uh, in the end than to eventually either enslave these people or basically kill them off because they were considered as racist. And you are part of that force. And um, willing or not, you are now being you are beginning to grow sympathetic towards these people, towards their struggle. As a soldier, you find yourself like between two grindstones. On the one hand, they didn't uh, like Bolshevism or the form of communism which they saw in the Soviet Union. But on the other hand, you were moving in with occupying force. Well, what are you going to do when you see these people suffering and you, and you feel with them and you want to help them somehow? What are you going to do? It was very difficult to go to the other side, but that changed in December of 1941. Uh, when Japan attacked the United States, uh, the Soviet Union became a part of the Allied forces, and at that moment it was easy to go to the other side, because also the uh, Soviet Union in this moment starts to change a little bit, at least with its behavior to uh, forces from uh, other countries. This process went through in 1942 and continued in 1943. Uh, at the end of 1943, the German headquarters called uh, the two Slovak divisions uh, from the Eastern Front away. They sent them home. The reason was uh, they considered, they were naming them uh, Pueblo, unsatisfactory. Far too many Slovak soldiers and officers were escaping these two divisions. Only in October of 1943, in one month, it was two and a half thousand. That army was going to be useless for them. They simply refusing to fight. Uh, to go alongside the things that were happening. So, uh, in December of 1943, the two Slovak divisions uh, from the Eastern Front are called away, and the Slovaks no longer of officially fight on the side of Nazi Germany. There were two remaining divisions. It was one technical division in Italy, but they did not fight. It only uh, was building uh, defenses and so on. And there was another technical division in Romania. But when Romania changed sides, they basically all came to the other side run over to the other side. So, all of these men returned back home, and of course, uh, they, most of them uh, immediately joined uh, various resistance groups and tried to do something uh, that will support the resistance in any way. Um, also, one important moment was, of course, the deportation of civilians, predominantly uh, racially persecuted people, the Jews. The government discredited itself with the deed. Uh, incredibly in the eyes of uh, not only its own population, but also in the eyes of the free world. Um, just to give you just a, uh, just a thought, basically, because a lot of it was already said, uh, up until, until, until the end of the basically First World War, uh, Czechoslovakia and Slovakia basically seen as the victim. We were the ones who were being uh, we were suffering throughout the Austria, in Austria Hungary, the regime, the, uh, the oppression basically of our national needs and so on. But now we are being the perpetrators. Uh, our army was fighting on the Eastern Front. Uh, members of these two Eastern Slovakian divisions, we must be honest, committed war crimes. That was a fact. That happened. So uh, we are now seen as an enemy, as a collaborator. Our small nation, our small country is now seen as an enemy, and that is, was a very, very, uh, it was a very difficult situation, a critical situation, especially how our nation will be dealt with uh, throughout the war and especially after the war. Something has to be done about that. Um, uh, there were also uh, open, open uh, expressions uh, of resistance against those deportations even, even within the country. Uh, people were trying to hide uh, many of these people. They were blocking of deportations, although the majority of the people were in the end deported. There were forms of resistance that could be achieved. 
Um, at the end of 1942, also because of these deportations, the influence of the resistance in general uh, starts to increase dramatically. Deportations uh, were also one of the key moments when the people in Slovakia in general, also members of the military, understood that this government is so radical uh, and it follows the orders, basically, of the needs of Nazi Germany so closely that if they will not do something about it, then this nation is going to be in a very difficult position after the war. Um, uh, of course, one of the most uh, important aspects of the resistance was the activities of the Slovak youth. Uh, usually students, the young people, are most active in this regard. Why? Because they do not have families. They do not have to fear for, for their children, for their wives, for anything. They usually have also the sense of adventure that has to be said as well. So, the Slovak students create their own uh, secret resistance groups, there were two, uh, Revolution Youth of Slovakia and the Slavic Resistance Organization. These were students from grammar schools or from universities which were actively uh, participating in the resistance and as I mentioned, the resistance at that time was mostly propaganda, writing, uh, making jokes uh, and uh, also, of course, supplying people who were hiding in Slovakia in one way or another. The end of 1943 is an absolutely crucial time frame for uh, Slovakia with regard to the resistance. As I mentioned, uh, the return of the two Eastern Slovakian division, uh, two, two Slovakian divisions from the Eastern Front back home. And at the end of 1943, the Czechoslovak government in exile uh, in the, from London signed a peace treaty or an allied treaty with the Soviet Union, with Stalin. And they promised if an uprising will start in Slovakia, we will aid it. We will help you in one form or another. That was very important. So, so they were promised that they will be able to uh, get help from the Soviets in if an uprising will start in Slovakia. Of course, uh, the resistance had to cooperate in some way or another. So at the end of 1943, all of these main representatives of these three resistance groups met and they agreed what I think was an absolutely historical moment that all the politicians agreed at least on one thing. They met, they uh, agreed upon, and they created what we now know uh, in our history as the Christmas Treaty, Vianočná Dohoda. It was agreed upon in uh, December of 1943. Why was it done on Christmas? Well, uh, many of these people were uh, followed, they were investigated, they were persecuted in some way. Well, but on Christmas, so they were followed. They were, it was written down, who are you going to meet? What do these people do? Where are they going? What are the people they communicate with? But Christmas was an exception, because on Christmas, people usually go and meet their friends and parents and relatives, and it's not uncommon just to go and visit your friends. So they wouldn't be followed back then. That's why the Christmas treaty, because they made clothes on Christmas. So that was very crucial. Uh, and they create the most important organization uh, which then later was responsible for the leading of the nation, uh, the Slovak National Council. It was the fourth time this Slovak National Council was created in Slovak history, and they set themselves a single aim. We are now going to prepare an armed uprising against the government, the most important thing, and against the German army, if it comes. But the most important aspect was the fight against its government. Uh, the reasons for why the uprising was started. Uh, the first one uh, were the crimes, the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that were committed in the responsibility of the, of the government. The deportations of, uh, of course, racially persecuted persons, uh, the persecution of political enemies, of course, uh, the party had in Slovakia, which were quite many. Quite many. Uh, also the activities of some uh, members of our army on the Eastern Front. Our army, these two Slovak divisions, did commit certain war crimes and somebody had to take responsibility. We were seen through the lens of these activities and it was necessary to show that we Slovaks are not like that. Yes, that what has happened in Slovakia was done by the government and its helpers. Let's be honest, there were quite many of them, but it was never the majority. And we have to, we, have, uh, we Slovaks are now responsible for it, the resistance, we have to clean the name of the Slovaks in the eyes of the free world. But that cannot, can be done only in, in one way, with active fighting. Because nobody will take you seriously if, uh, in any other way. It is not, it is not sufficient to say, uh, we are very sorry after the war. Because nobody is going to take you seriously. That's not going to be enough. 
Uh, we are very sorry that bad things happen, but uh, it's all way now. Let's be friends again, the free world Americans and all of that. No, that's not good. If you wanna, if you wanna be taken seriously, you have to fight. You have to help. And many of the resistance members back then very often used the words of Milan Rastislav Stepanik when he was in uh, the United States in uh, 1917, later than also once in 1918 in Pittsburgh, when he was mobilizing the Czechs and Slovaks in the United States, he was telling them, uh, brothers, Czechs and Slovaks, if we want to uh, get our own country the first, for the first time in history, we have to pay for it in blood. There's no other way. We have to fight for it. So that was the way. Only with fight you can clear your name. Um, the second, more pragmatic reasons were the general uh, fears of the population with regard to the war. For four years, war evaded Slovakia, almost five years, but now it is coming. That is inevitable. The Eastern Front will come. And as a uh, person living in Slovakia at this time, you would have only two sources of, in, uh, of objective information of uh, what was actually happening in the world. One was the free London radio, if you would get, uh, if you would get it, if you could uh, listen to it. It was not always available, because, for example, uh, every day at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there was a Czechoslovak hour. So all the things that happened in the world were sent out in the Czech and Slovak language to everybody in Europe who had a uh, radio apparatus and who could listen to it. That was the first way. And the second way, uh, way how to get information was uh, from the soldiers who were returning back home from the front. And they were telling the stories which they seen, how they survived, what was happening there. The majority of our soldiers fighting on the Eastern Front were between 18 and 21 years old. Altogether, 70,000 of Slovak soldiers went through these Eastern Slovakian divisions. And when they were turning home, I do not have the pictures here from uh, hospitals, for example, with their leg legs and arms heavily wounded. Of course, they tell what they see, what they survived, and how the war really looks like and what's going to happen. Millions of people uh, are dying, uh, starvation, the whole destruction of cities. Just to give you an approximation, in uh, White Russia, before the war, there were 274 cities. Throughout the war, uh, 240 were completely destroyed, raised to the ground, basically. And something like that is coming to Slovakia. No way. No way. We know that the war is coming. It is inevitable. But when the war comes, we have to make sure that the Eastern Front moves through the country as quickly as possible. We have to save uh, the civilian population, the innocent women and children and those people, the horrors of war, as much as possible. We cannot stop the front, it will move to the country, but we have to make sure that it moves as quickly as possible, that the suffering is as uh, least as possible. The preparation for the uprising. Uh, very difficult. It took almost, uh, almost a year and there were two aspects. The economic preparations and the military preparations. The economic preparations included building of warehouses, uh, getting weapons together, uh, preparing um, secret stashes for equipment, getting, for example, um, the right people into the right positions to be able to support. Thousands of people were involved in preparation of the uprising. Also, high members of the government knew that the uprising is being prepared and they were part of it in secret. What's the most astonishing thing uh, is that, that so many people knew about the uprising and it was never betrayed by anybody. Up until the last moment, nobody knew that an uprising in this matter is going, is going to start in Slovakia. When it started, I will talk about it, it was a complete shock, even for the Germans. So, the preparations were very um, uh, complicated and it was decided that the headquarters of the uh, army in the uprising will be in central Slovakia. You all seen the map of Slovakia, I presume, so you know it is very mountainous, very hilly, and can be very well defended against a much stronger enemy. Especially central Slovakia is very well suited for a defensive type of warfare, which it was probably to, is going to be, so it was chosen as the center. The headquarters was Banska Bystrica, because that's where the first uh, field army had its headquarters with Jan Golian. Um, two uh, men are uh, very well known that they helped repair the uh, uprising economically. Basically, they were the main responsible people, and those were two on the photographs on the left. That's 
uh, Imeri Karvas, on the right, that's Peter Zaczko Imeri Karvas was the uh, head of the uh, Slovak National Bank and Peter Zaczko was the head of the Supreme Office for Provisions. What these two men achieved is absolutely incredible. Especially Peter Zaczko, who was, uh, who was the head of this, of this office, was responsible for the distribution of food all throughout Slovakia. And these two men saw that uh, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of August 1944, that there is a real danger that the German army will probably invade Slovakia very soon. So what they had done is that they distributed three months of food to uh, all the families in Slovakia up front. They knew that if the uprising is successful, the Fro Eastern Front will move to the country for approximately two to three months. In those two uh, to three months, nobody must be hungry in Slovakia. They were successful in that. The people really got those provisions. An absolutely incredible feat what they, what they had achieved. Uh, what was Imri Karbash also famous for, he was the governor of the National Bank. And of course, when the uprising is going to start, uh, the land which the army will control will have to, con will have to continue working. The jobs, uh, the shops, uh, the government, everything must continue functioning like normally. It was supposed to be like a state within a state. So you need money for that, for that, for economics to work. So what he has done, when in June 1944, uh, the American forces were uh, bombing uh, Apollo, the, the fuel production refinery in Bratislava, some of the bombs fell on Bratislava itself. They killed uh, a few hundred people, but he used the fact that we came to the government and said, well, um, you see that now the war is looming closer and closer, we are being bombed now, and if those bombs hit the center of the city and our national bank, we will lose all our money, all our gold, and the country will be without any resources. Why not move it to cities like Banska Vistrica, and He said, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do that. So, so uh, he actually did uh, several billions worth of money was sent into the into these towns, and they formed the basis of the economics of the uh, country which they controlled. It was really incredible feat. I will talk about their fates during the communist regime and uh, more. They really, uh, really ended up very, very, very badly. Well, the military preparations were very difficult, very tough at the beginning. Um, there was a lack of a leading personality. They, the resistance had problems of finding a person. Uh, someone who would be would be skilled enough and who would be willing, and especially one who would have the authority within the military to lead something like that. So after the discussions between uh, the government in exile and uh, the Slovak National Council, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jan Golian was uh, taken for this position because he was the, he was the commander of the field army in Banska Bystrica, a very high position in the army. And he was, many of his staff members were already members of the resistance. So he was designated that you, with cooperation of other people from the Slovak government, those who are preparing the uprising economically, you will be responsible for the military preparations. Get the men together, inform them, find those people who are willing to co cooperate and start preparing a plan for the uprising. Prepare a plan how we can do that the uprising will be uh, successful. Uh, that was why it was uh, General, later General Jan Gullian chosen. Well, he was a staff officer of the first division on the Eastern Front. So uh, a staff officer does not command soldiers on the field, he organizes. He knows that how to supply basically the army and so on. So his position was very important at this very moment. Therefore, uh, that is the reason why he was chosen. The advantage uh, the military had was that the majority of officers actually studied uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, not in Slovakia. So they had high military education, uh, especially which they got in military schools in uh, Moravia and were therefore predominantly of Czechoslovak orientation. They uh, didn't really like the Slovak state, they were citizens of the Czechoslovak, of Czechoslovakia, and they, they found themselves in a state who nobody, there was no democratic elections or nothing, you were dictated. So many were against this state. Um, the regular soldiers, after their experiences on the Eastern Front, also had a very strong anti-Nazi orientation. They saw the crimes, they saw the horrors of war, and didn't want to be part of it. And they understood that if they don't do any, something about it, that the Slovakia will suffer uh, as well. So in general, the military was aimed against the government. Their notions were anti-Nazi, anti-fascist. Um, the key for 
the uprising to be successful uh, were the military units in the eastern part of Slovakia. This is the map of Slovakia, which describes it uh, really well. It's in Slovak, but I will, I will just very short tell you. Uh, the green circle on the right shows the position of two Eastern Slovakian divisions. There are about 40,000 men there. Um, these two divisions were the most important aspect in the uprising. Uh, the plan for the uprising looked as follows. These two Eastern Slovakian divisions, when the Eastern Front will move to the borders of Slovakia, uh, when the, the, a signal is given to them, they will close off the Carpathian passes to the retreating German forces which will move into Slovakia. They will attack them. A breakthrough will be created in the front and they will allow the Soviet forces to enter the country and at the very same moment when a signal is given, uh, all military garrisons within Slovakia will rise up and they will try to block off the German advance. When this uprising is called on, it started, the German army will try to invade the country. And the army was supposed to stop them, to block them off for at least some time. They will allow the Soviet forces to enter Slovakia, to move to the country quickly, and together with them, they will then be able to push out the German forces out of Slovakia, wherever they, wherever they are, and if it is successful, then it will probably take two to three months to push them out, and basically that will be the war's end for Slovakia. And both aims will be fulfilled. We cleared our name because we helped ourselves. It was a very uh, important, difficult, uh, very important political uh, matter that we will help ourselves in this matter. And the second, well, the civilian population did not suffer that much. So these were the aims. This was the plan for the uprising. Very complicated plan. It last, the preparations lasted uh, for over a year. And everything which is complicated can go wrong. It went wrong. <laughs> Why? Uh, so, the start of the uprising was planned for October of 1944, not for August, for October of 1944. The moment when the Red Army and the Czechoslovak Army Corps, uh, which was already fighting on the Eastern Front and was preparing to liberate uh, Czechoslovakia, those were the Czechs and Slovaks who deserted from the Eastern Slovakian divisions uh, in the during the Second World War, joined up the other forces and were preparing to liberate their own country. So in October it was supposed to happen. Well, uh, well, what, what basically happened? Why did the German army invade the moment it did? What, action, or what was the reason? Well, um, Golian and his officers understood one thing very clearly. Our army, which can uh, arm a maximum of around 100 to 120,000 soldiers, cannot fight and win against the German army. That's impossible. We cannot do that at all. That's not possible. Uh, the German army in the summer of 1944, after the huge losses it suffered, it still had 10 million soldiers in arms. Against such a, such a power, which is arming for 10 years, it, will, it would be very difficult to actually fight them. What they can do is fight and hold them off for some time. But they needed military help from somebody. Uh, and the Soviets promised help, of course. So that was the agreement between the Czechoslovak government in exile, the treaty, and Stalin. Well, of course, uh, they didn't see any danger of communism or anything else at the time of Bolshevism coming to. They simply needed military help from somebody. The Soviets offered help, so they happily accepted it. So, uh, well, unfortunately, the Germans were not stupid as well. They were also very clever. And what they understood at that point was that Slovakia starts to become uh, uh, strategically a very important country. August 1944 was the moment, or July and August 1944 was the moment when the German army on the Eastern Front almost collapsed. They lost so much territory, so many men, that it was uh, almost visible that the war will probably end till the end of the year. That they are struggling so hard that what they're fighting will be, uh, is probably, they will not probably survive in the summer. That was the thought. Uh, on the 1st of August, uh, they neared Warsaw. A huge uprising started in Warsaw. On the 23rd of August, the Soviet forces neared Romania, and Romania, who was an ally of Nazi Germany for over five years, who sent hundreds of thousands of soldiers to the Eastern Front, uh, changed sides from one day to the next. And the Germans was, were forced to uh, evacuate Romania very quickly, and the Eastern Front moves into the Balkans. They're losing hundreds of kilometers, basically, every day. And that was the situation which forced them to rethink their strategies. Slovakia at that moment became strategically very important. 
because if you compare it to Poland and Hungary, to Poland and Hungary is mostly flatland. That's very easy to overcome. But Slovakia is very mountainous, very hilly, it can be very well defended, even against a much stronger enemy. And that's what the uh, German army needed at this point, to defend, to slow them down. They cannot do that in Poland and Hungary, but they can do that in Slovakia. And if they slow them down there, they will automatically slow them down in Poland and Hungary as well. So, uh, in early August 1944, it was decided uh, in the German headquarters that Slovakia will be invaded as quickly as time allows. It is already decided up front. One last reason was stopping them. We were an ally of Nazi Germany. You cannot invade your ally just like that. You will look very badly in the eyes of your remaining allies. So you need to find a reason, a scapegoat to invade the country. And they found it. Because between July and August 1944, the first Soviet partisan units were dispatched into Slovakia. And of course, that task was to make the lives of the Germans difficult behind the front. Blow up transports of uh, war material moving to the Eastern Front. Uh, shoot officers who were on vacations. And do basically everything possible uh, to make their lives difficult before the front comes. And that was basically a catastrophe for Goliath and his officers. Because they needed peace within the country at this moment, not to provoke the Germans. Well, there were agreements even made. Golian asked the Soviet headquarters that it should, it should lower the activities of these Soviet partisans. Uh, the reply uh, was from the uh, partisan headquarters in Kiev to the, the order towards the partisan units in, in uh, Slovakia that, well, you can continue uh, uh, sabotage actions, but do not provoke the Germans. <laughs> well, uh, difficult, difficult to, what, what actually to make out of this. It has to be said that many Soviet officers were here and said, okay, we understand, you, you're planning something, so we will, we will leave the Germans uh, like they are for now, but on the other hand, some did not. Uh, that what was left fighting after four years of war in the Soviet army was not the best and brightest, that is to be said as well. Uh, after those huge losses, after the loss of 11 million soldiers, you know, there were criminals there, there were elements there who really weren't too likely to follow all the orders explicitly, and they were continuing um, uh, killing of Germans, and they were also massacring German civilians in Slovakia. They killed approximately 2,000 people in this matter, the Soviet partisans. So uh, that, was, that was reason enough. The last drop was that on the 27th of uh, August 1944, German officers were moving to the town of Martin. Um, Martin, you can, yeah, please move there. Turchansky Sveti Martin is on the top left in those yellow areas. You can see there. Uh, German officers' commission was moving uh, through that town in a train. They were moving from Romania, which changed sides. They were evacuating the forces and they were moving back to Germany. And the Soviet partisan a group uh, called Verichka got wind of that, that this train with these officers moving through that town and decided to stop them. So they stopped the train, they took all these people out, these officers had their families with them, they took them out and they transported them to the local barracks where the military was. Well, um, and they told them, yeah, you are going to now give us your weapons, you're going to be uh, captured and you have to be, and you have to still now be jailed. But the Germans said, why? Was the reason we are your allies? What's, what's happening here? That, that's not going to happen. So they were, they were in the barracks. They started arguing, and we don't, don't know what exactly happened, but they were, uh, they were getting more and more emotional. At the end, the effect was that they started pulling weapons on each other, and uh, what happened then was that sh shooting erupted, and the end effect was that many of these German officers were shot, together with some members of their families. And it happened in the barracks, where the army was. That means that the government must have, uh, the government will know very quickly and it will have to take responsibility for that. At the end of August 1944, it was called also the half summer of 1944, because partisan units were moving into various towns in Slovakia to Ruzhombero and declaring them, you are free now, it's a free city. Everybody thought that the front will come in one or two weeks. The German army was collapsing, everybody was expecting in a few weeks the war is end and you are now free. The government absolutely lost control of its territory. They lost. The regime simply collapsed. Policemen, uh, how did it look like? An order came from Bratislava to pressure. Yeah, uh, jail this person, this person, this person. His, his member of the resistance. Yeah, the policeman looked at it. He was an adult. 
whatever. And they don't, they don't have it. The, the regime simply lost control of the host territory. And in this situation, this thing happened. A communique came from Berlin to Bratislava, which stated, uh, your government is no longer able to, sa uh, to safeguard the security of our citizens. The German army is coming to Slovakia to defend its interests. Invasion. It meant invasion. The German forces uh, attack, uh, invade Slovakia in the late hours of the 28th of August 1944. They moved in from three sides, from the west, from the north, and from the uh, east. And they start demobilizing uh, the Slovak army, which wasn't yet completely prepared for the uprising. Um, at 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, uh, General uh, Lieutenant Colonel, the later General Jan Golian, as the commander of the field, for the field army in Moscow Bistrica, starts receiving uh, information that the German army invaded Slovakia. He started receiving those orders. They didn't know exactly from where they came, but they started that the garrisons are being demobilized and they needed, or they needed orders. So he decided that uh, the situation is very dire, so he gave the order to all military garrisons he had under control be on high alert. Call all soldiers, all officers immediately to the garrisons. Uh, be prepared to go into action very, very quickly. They decided for one thing. They decided that they will wait until 7 o'clock in the evening. Because at 7 o'clock in the evening, it was stated that the defense minister, Ferdinand Chaklosh, and later Josef Tiso will have a speech. And they hoped that these people will come to sense and they will call for a general uprising for the whole nation. We are now being attacked. We don't basically good reason. We were an ally and our ally is going to attack us. They hope that these people will see reason at this very moment and they will call for the nation to get together and uh, fight against the invader. Well, at 7 o'clock the speech started with Ferdinand Chakos, the uh, defense minister. He was basically jailed at this very moment uh, and they forced him, he was basically at gunpoint, and they forced him to stay uh, lay down your weapons, uh, Slovak soldiers. The German army is coming to help us, to uh, liberate us against uh, whomever. Uh, do not fight them, they are our friends. Uh, then let's not uh, fight against them so that, uh, you know, we will regret it later, basically. Give up your weapons, lay down your weapons, do not fight against the Germans. When this statement came out, one hour later, Jan Golian gives his order, start to evacuate. That was the secret signal which all officers in all garrisons were acquainted with, uh, all the soldiers. If this order is given, the secret order to the garrisons, it means Germany attacked Slovakia. From now on, the Germans are our enemies. Soldiers, fulfill your oath, defend your country, the uprising starts now. So, the yellow areas in the middle, this is the territory which the Slovak army held uh, in the very first day of the uprising. Uh, when the uprising started, the Slovak army renamed itself the first Czechoslovak army in Slovakia. Um, these were the territories which they held the very first day, and it was an area of 20,000 square kilometers, and they, uh, in these areas, with approximately 1.7 million people. Um, with regard to how big the uprising was, uh, throughout the history of the Second World War, there wasn't a single bigger military uprising than the Slovak nation uprising. With, re with regards to how many people were involved. That was the reason for that. Because we had our army. We had an army which could actually fight. In uh, Bohemia, such an uprising was impossible because they didn't have an army. In uh, Warsaw, it was also very difficult. They had to make their own weapons. They couldn't make such a huge uprising. They didn't have an army. They couldn't have it. What they achieved, even with those little means they had to resist for two months, was incredible. But we had an army which could fight and which could, uh, if everything you know, goes as planned, could be successful uh, for uh, sparing the country. So uh, you can see those blue arrows. This shows uh, where the first German units basically attacked the country. Uh, and those green circles over there. Because the uprising started prematurely, uh, these two Eastern Slovakian divisions didn't get the right orders. These two men, uh, Augustin Malar and uh, William Talski, were the commanders of these two Eastern Slovakian divisions. They were the, more, the responsible ones. And there was one problem which Golian had all throughout the preparation of the uprising. Well, he was a lieutenant colonel. And among the army officers, sometimes it's like among school children on a field. 
Well, not everybody wanted to listen to me. Well, I'm a colonel and you are a lieutenant colonel. Why should I follow your orders? So he lacked a little bit of authority. He needed more time to get all these people together. But the Germans already attacked. So there was not really much time. So he gave the order to these two men. Uh, the uprising starts now. The Germany invaded. You now have to fight. Well, one of them, uh, Malar, behaved very, uh, very strangely uh, because he was an uh, he liked Ferdinand Chatosh, and he um, he's basically knew how the uprising should uh, should went out. So when Golian's order came in, start fighting, leave the garrisons, build your positions, block of the uh, block of the Carpathian passes. He gave a counter order: soldiers, return back to your barracks. Uh, our time has not yet come. He said that. And that was, that's, that was basically the end of his office. The Germans came in, they demobilized the army, they took, they took him, they said, well, if you wouldn't study today, you would study tomorrow, it doesn't matter to us. They took him into a concentration camp and he died. So that was, that was the unfortunate end for his soldiers. The other one, William Talski, he, he, made, even, uh, he made also a big mistake because uh, he left his staff officers and he flew uh, to behind the uh, behind the front to the Soviet Soviet lines. He wanted to, you know, cooperate. He made to make a plan together with the with the commanders just to make for it to be successful. But he left his units alone in the moment when the order was given to start fighting. And the moment he returned, or uh, two days later, his division was demobilized completely. They were left alone. From these forty thousand soldiers who were on the eastern front, four thousand managed to escape the captivity. They were all demobilized, basically captured and uh, sent to prison of war camps or uh, forced work or had to done uh, any other stuff. So only these 40,000 remaining soldiers managed to move into the mountains and fight on. And this means that the German army gets control of the Carpathian passes. They now achieved exactly what they wanted. They got the mountainous areas, they got the very difficult positions, and it was now clear that the Soviet army will not be able to move into Slovakia quickly enough. Well, um, what happened next? Uh, the, uh, the garrisons were given the orders, and 18,000 men, the first 18,000 men, went from these garrisons and started fighting against the uh, German invading forces. Um, these 18,000 men, uh, I will show you the map then later on, these 18,000 men managed to stop the German advance in the first week of the uprising. The red lines you can see there in the middle. So the first red lines, that was the uh, land the, resist, the army held in the first day of the uprising. The second red line, no, we'll leave it there. The second red line in the middle, that's after one week of fighting. That's where the German army was stopped. And now they had to decide, what are we going to do? We are cut off from, we are cut off from the front line. How are we going to meet up with them? So, uh, they communicated with the Soviet headquarters and a decision was made. Two possibilities now exist. Either everyone will be mobilized and we try to break through the Carpathian passes to the east to link up with the Soviet army. That's one possibility. Or the second one, we will hold our ground, we will stay in central Slovakia, we will hold these areas for as long as we can, and we will leave the Soviet army and the Czechoslovak army forces there to break through the Carpathian passes and link up with us. They were divided by 150 kilometers. This photograph, that's uh, Jan Golia. He was the commander of the forces during the uprising. Um, uh, the army mobilized, there were two waves of mobilizations and 60,000 soldiers entered the army. From these 60,000 soldiers, 50,000 were Slovaks and 10,000 were foreign soldiers. Logically, the majority Czechs and Moravians and Russians. There was almost four, three and a half to 4,000 men were fighting. There were officers there, uh, many of them were students who learned when they got wind, yeah, an uprising started in Slovakia, they illegally crossed the borders and tried to link up and join with the army. It was the fight for Czechoslovakia. The, the army was fighting for the reestablishment of the Czechoslovak Republic and that's why the army was renamed the first Czechoslovak army in Slovakia. So, but they had a difficult uh, difficult, say, uh, difficult situation. After the first two weeks of the uprising, the army was reorganized into six tactical groups just to better defend uh, the territory. Now you have, uh, you see, you see basically a map of how the front lines changed throughout the two months. The army was able to effectively defend itself. It's in Slovakia, but what's important, the numbers there, that's first week, three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks, and eight weeks. So up until the seventh week, they're more or less controlled at least the center crowd of Slovakia. 
the fightings which happened on the fronts of the Slavic national uprising were extremely heavy. Uh, there was fight between tanks, uh, the losses on both sides were quite severe, and the resistance army managed to inflict high losses on the German military. For example, during the uh, Battle of Telgard, the German lost uh, over 500 soldiers, died around uh, 400 wounded. The uh, Slovak army only lost 10. So the, the battles were extremely bloody, uh, very difficult, and they were took a very uh, took a long time. The first general, who, uh, German general, who came into Slovakia to, uh, to basically to beat down the uprising, that was SS General Gottlob Berger. After two weeks, they had to call him off because he was in shock. He couldn't simply understand what was happening. He thought that he's going to into Slovakia and they're going to fight against a few partisan units, and after one or two weeks, the whole uprising is being defeated, uh, beaten down. When the German units entered Slovakia, they were in a state of shock. They understood they are not fighting against uh, partisans, they are fighting against the regular army with tanks, with airplanes, He's, which is very skilled because they fought alongside them for two and a half years on the Eastern Front. They knew their tactics, they knew how the German army worked, and they knew how to defend themselves. And they were in a very mountainous areas and could inflict huge losses on them. So the Germans were in a state of shock and they understood it's not, it's going to take longer. So the battles lasted for almost two months. So you can see the areas there. Um, the army f uh, fights for a very long time. The, uh, the, the battles are very, very, very bloody. Uh, and <clears throat> at the, uh, in the middle of October, a new man is sent into Slovakia to uh, take command of the Slovak army. Uh, Jan Golian was still the main, basically the general, but he still wasn't the highest figure possible to have, uh, to, have to be control in control of the army, to have sufficient authority in that regard. So this man was sent into Slovakia. General Rudolf Viest. General Rudolf Viest, he was in exile in London, and to give you a little bit of, of his backstory, um, he was the only Slovak who became a general in the, uh, in the time of the first Czechoslovak Republic, in the 1920s, 1930s. He was the single Slovak who was a general. A man of immense authority in Slovakia. He was a former legionnaire, he fought in the, in the legions, uh, who commanded them. He was an office, high officer, he was very experienced, and he knew how to fight effectively. He was sent in on the 6th of October 1944, but unfortunately, during, at this time already, it was clear that the army is in such a difficult position that uh, he probably won't have, uh, won't have much possibility to change the situation. The battles uh, in the eastern part of Slovakia are raging on. Uh, as promised, the Soviets started the so-called Carpathian Dukla operation uh, to link up with the, uh, with the, Slo with the Czechoslovak army in Slovakia. Um, they had to cross 150 kilometers. Um, if you ever go to Slovakia, there is a museum dedicated to the Carpathian Dukla operation. Uh, if you want, the workers there can also lead you to a valley in those mountains, the Valley of Death it is called. Uh, there's a small mountain on that valley, and that valley changed sides uh, uh, 21 times in 14 days. There was a huge tank battle which took place between the German army and the Soviet army in that valley. Uh, and after two months, the Czechoslovak army, for, uh, army forces and the Soviet army managed to cross 30 kilometers. They, at the beginning of October, they liberated the first village in Czechoslovakia, in, in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia uh, and it cost 60,000 soldiers their lives on both sides together, for those 30 kilometers. Uh, the battles in the Carpathian passes are one of the bloodiest in the whole entire history of the Second World War. So uh, they understood the army was struggling. The resistant army needed weapons, needed equipment, and they were fighting on, but they were fighting a losing battle. Um, uh, the efforts are being, they are being pushed into the mountains more and more. What happened was that on the 20th of October, 1944, the uh, Germans started a general offensive. They called 50,000 soldiers with a large amount of tanks into Slovakia. They simply stated, we, we cannot allow ourselves for this army to exist behind our lines. We have to beat them down and quickly move our soldiers to the Eastern Front to fight off against the Soviets. So they attacked the resistance territory. So they attacked these areas from four sides, from the west, from the north, from the east, and from the south. From the west, from the north, and from the east, the army was still able to basically to defend itself. But the south wasn't sufficiently defended anymore. And the Germans used uh, Hungarian military bases 
uh, as a staging point on attack on the uh, territory of the army. The reason was there was a change of regime in, in Hungary. Horthy was put down, Ferenc Sala, she came in with this regime of the Arab process, and the Hungarian government gave the Germans the possibility to attack from Hungarian military bases into Slovakia. So this area is getting really smaller, smaller, and smaller very quickly. There is, the soldiers have to retreat. Uh, and the last order to the army was on the 27th of October 1944. It was given out by this man, General Rudolf Viest. Uh, and the last order states, uh, simply give, that's what he, what, what, is, what he basically said. Soldiers, I am dissolving the army. I am dissolving the army. You are now responsible. Destroy everything, every tank, every vehicle, every train, airplane, truck, whatever. We cannot carry into the mountains. You have to destroy. The Germans must not use it against us. Officers, retreat with your soldiers in an organized manner into the mountains. Carry as much weaponry as you possibly can. We are not giving up. We are continuing the fight in a partisan way or a guillotine kind of warfare. If you cannot fight as a regular army anymore, you have to reorganize completely and get into the mountains. But the losses were severe. From the 60,000 soldiers, only 20,000 managed to retreat into the mountains. And their lives were, of course, very, very difficult. They had hoped that the liberation will come in a matter of weeks, or at least perhaps in a month, that, that they will last in, in those times, uh, those, that time in the mountains with ease. It took six months. The Eastern Front moved to Slovakia for nine months. So that's why I mentioned the international particip uh, participation. So uh, over 300,000 Czechs, Moravians, uh, Russians, Ukrainians, 800 Hungarians formed on our side. Uh, 400, uh, 400 Frenchmen or French soldiers or uh, sympathizers, 200 Germans changed sides as well. They started fighting on the sides of the Flag Army, and at least 90 Americans and Brits were also there, also part of it. They uh, were mostly the airmen who were shot down about Slovakia. They joined with the, with the army and were later on at least partially evacuated. Not all of them made them out, many of them were then killed. What happened after the army was pushed into the mountains? Uh, they continue fighting on, uh, they continue the struggle, but it's also the time of the, the most tragic time in the history of Slovakia, the reprisals. The starting of uh, destruction of villages, the civilian population was persecuted because of course they supported the remnants of the army in the mountains and the partisans, and the uh, Nazis basically wanted to destroy these bases of operations to make their lives difficult as much as possible, and they started burning down villages, in, predominantly in central Slovakia, and executing civilians. The statistics are uh, 102 burned down villages, 211 mass graves, and 5,500 people dead after the war. That's the statistic we have. That's how they ended up. Unfortunately, this was not only done by the, by the Nazis, by the SS or by the Germans or the sympathizers, no. It was done by the Linkas Guards as well. The biggest massacre which happened in uh, the town of Niemetska, there was a lime kiln there, where the limes did lose. There was a big furnace there. So um, uh, people were sent into this, into this area and they were shot and burned alive. They were killed in this manner. Uh, it was thought up until the early 1950s that this was done predominantly uh, by the SS or by the sympathizers. In the early 1950, these people who were doing these things were found. Not all of them, but all of them were found. And it was found out it was all the members of the Hinkas Guards. Slovaks were murdered in Slovaks. And who they murdered? For example, family members of uh, Slovak officers. They couldn't get them because they were fighting in the mountains, so they took their families and murdered them there. Uh, or a racially persecuted persons, or political enemies. So that's how it got. That uh, it really looked like civil war a little bit in Slovakia. So Slovaks were fighting against Slovaks. These people were then, uh, some of them, were, many of them were then found, but not all of them. And after they were persecuted. 1950s, of course, that's a time of political processes uh, and, uh, and such, such matters. But I would say that an exception is, are these processes with these criminals because the evidence was simply so staggering that they were, they were, they were absolutely guilty. These people were then burned in the lime kiln and nothing remained of them. We do not have the exact number. We, can, we have only an, an, an estimate based on two things, and that's how many people were jailed before they were murdered. We have a book of inmates uh, from Banska Bystrica and the number of trucks which, were, which went into Nemecka with full of people and returned empty. So 900 is up the uh, approximate number. Huh? That's how many people were murdered there. Um, it took nine months uh, for the 
for the liberation of the country. The time was very sad, very bad. What were, what were the effects of the uprising, just to give you what with regard to these two aims? Um, well, um, the first aim was fulfilled almost completely. The Slovaks cleared the enemy in the eyes of the free world. We were not considered enemies after the war. Um, one very important, um, we were not considered enemies, but of course the uprising didn't went, went through as they wanted. The civilian population suffered for a long time. They, had, they were exposed to the horrors of war for a full nine months. It had one positive aspect though. Because of the uprising, when the Soviet army entered Slovakia, their soldiers were given an explicit order. You are now entering an allied country. An allied country. Behave yourselves. We will, I will not say that things were, there were rapes, there were murders, people were sending to gulags. That happened, it was very often, but never got to a such an extent as it happened, for example, in Hungary, which was a country that remained an ally of West Germany until the end of the war, or in German countries like in East Prussia or Silesia, where a lot of German population lived. They, the Soviet soldiers, committed a lot of crimes that took revenge for what was done back in their country. Slovakia was spared to a, to a lot of extent to these crimes. They happened, they happened, but it was much less in percentage-wise compared to average. So, because we were already seen as an ally, that was very important. And uh, the second aim, well, like I mentioned, only partially fulfilled. Uh, uh, and what happened then after the war, basically the, all the men, all the people who were in the uprising involved were heroes. It was held as heroes, it was a, absolutely the greatest moment in the history of the Slovaks. It was the biggest fight they ever fought, never before. Uh, they fought with such power against, against such an enemy with, with such strength. Um, and unfortunately, the fates of these people is then done, is done quite very sad or, or complicated. Um, the new republic was in a struggle between the communists and the democrats for the coming three years between 1945 and 1948. And in 1948, when the uh, communists took power in the country, uh, huge persecutions started happening, even uh, political processes, executions, uh, and it were mostly aimed against the soldiers who fought in the uprising. The reason is simple. These people were fighting for the re-establishment of the first Czechoslovak Republic, which was a democracy. The most, the strongest force in the uprising was, were the Democrats, those who wanted uh, basically freedom after the war. The communists had their role, but it was smaller because there were not enough of them. There were quite many of them. And they understood after 1948 that they simply do not have sufficient support in Slovakia. The elections in 1946 showed that. 67% of the vote went to the Democratic Party. And they saw that they are not supported sufficiently. Their solution was civil persecution. The statistics say that 50,000 people were uh, persecuted in Slovakia with the connection of the uprising. Without exception, every officer, uh, every commander of the six tactical divisions was jailed and executed, for example. It was also happened. Uh, I can mention one case. Uh, my Major William Shingor, who was the first officer who refused to go uh, on the Eastern Front and started organizing his own resistance, he escaped the army. He was a national hero. Uh, after 1945. Um, in 1947, he printed a small booklet. We have it in the museum. It's a, it's a very small booklet. It's called The Second Uprising. And in that booklet, he stated, we who have suffered through the hells of the winter of 1944-45 in the, in the mountains during the uprising are not afraid to go into the mountains a second time against you communists. And they executed him for that. Um, the fates of Jan Golian and uh, Rudolf Wiest are sad ones. They were captured in November of 1944. They didn't manage to get into the mountains together with their, with their soldiers. They were transported to Germany for questioning and they were uh, murdered in the Flossenburg concentration camp. We cannot say that for sure, but that's the possibility where they ended up. Uh, how, the, for example, the family of Jan Golian, how he ended up. They had a son, Ivan Golian. He died a month ago in Prague. He was, he was quite a gentleman. He was their son. He was only six months old when the uprising started and when his father saw him for the last time at the end of October. Um, they were attempting uh, with his wife to have a child for 10 years. Finally, finally they were successful. So he went to the mountains, he didn't return and she remained alone with her son. When her son was five years old in the early 1950s, the secret police came into their home and they took her away for five years that she was jailed. 
without any reason, without ever being indicted by the secret police, she was jailed as a political enemy. They left Ivan Golian uh, home alone for a week without food, without anything. They simply took her mother away and left him as a boss. His uncle found him after one week. And you know, a five-year-old child uh, alone for a week, absolutely nothing to hear, to hear then late from psychological problems as well. Um, when he was 12 years old, his history teacher called him to, to answer in front of the class. And, he, and his, his question was, uh, he was supposed to uh, answer questions about the Swag National Uprising. Well, he was quiet. He said another word. He knew why, yeah. So, the, his teacher sat him down and told him, sit down, what can you know, the son of a traitor? That's how these people were seen, as enemies. The communist regime, uh, the, he was successful, they escaped in 1969 to Great Britain, and after 1989 they both returned and they lived in Prague, where Ivan Golian died a month ago. So the communist regime then stole the history of the uprising. They completely deformed it. Um, uh, if you would enter our museum, the Museum of the Slavic National Uprising, which was finished in 1969, if you go to the second exposition there, which was made, you wouldn't find a single mention about the army and the uprising. Everything was just about partisans, 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 and Soviet partisans. They were named as the carriers of the communist ideals. So everything which regarded the army was pushed under the carpet. For 40 years, basically. They deformed. They were uh, not showing the history as the problem is down, and these people uh, suffered greatly. I can, uh, I can name one other, other case that was uh, one of the officers, he was jailed for 20 years. He was sent into, the, into a work camp in the uh, uranium mines in, uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia. Um, and it, what, was, what was strange, he said he survived those, he, he was there for a long time. We were, we, many of those officers who were in the uprising and single men, uh, we were jailed and we found ourselves together again in those mines or in those camps, basically, which were there. And he was the, I, I questioned him, he, unfortunately he died a few years ago, and he said, for, he said that during the winter it was, for example, so cold that we, have, we had to pee on each other's legs just to, just to survive. And these were the men who were sacrificing their lives for the country. And that's how the government, the communist regime, treated them. Uh, well, in the 1960s, the regime was getting uh, lenient after Stalin's death, of course, there were the rehabilitation, rehabilitation process of many of these people, but not all of them were re rehabilitated in the 1970s after Czechoslovakia has been invaded again, of course, by the uh, countries of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, this rehabilitation process more or less was on hold, or basically stopped, it only partially fulfilled, and complete rehabilitation was only done after 1989, but of course, many of these people were already so this is the uh, uh, history of the uprising. Well, only after 1989 can we talk about these uh, items very objectively. Uh, our museum, the Museum of the Slovak National Uprising, tries to be as objective as possible with regard to all aspects of the, uh, of the war and also about the uprising. There were not only good deeds were done, also of course soldiers commit crimes sometimes. It happens. We try to be objective as much as possible. But the general idea of the uprising uh, is still lives on, and what was the most striking uh, moral effect uh, after the war, uh, the huge moral victory of uh, basically not only of the Czech but also the Slovak nation was that uh, before the war the Slovak nation basically didn't exist on paper for all the other countries in the world. We were still a Czechoslovak nation. We were one nation. So. After the, uh, after the uprising, at the end of the Second World War, all the countries on the world acknowledged that yes, a Czech and Slovak nation exists in central Slovakia on this planet and it lives in this very small country. That's how when we started to exist on paper separately, basically. 75 years old, our nations are basically on paper. Only then we started to exist officially for everybody. So, uh, thank you very much, um, and I uh, want to express my gratitude, also the gratitude of my institution, the Museum of the Slovak National Uprising, for being here and telling you these stories. So thank you.